I have lots of thoughts and feelings. My beloved <laughs> Silas, who's also beautiful, because of course he is beautiful. I love it, I love it, I love it, I love it. Hi everybody, welcome on in to today's video. I hope you're doing well. My name is Julie, I'm an artist and illustrator, but I also love to talk about books. And today we're gonna to be talking about all the books I read in February. This is a reading wrap up for the month of February. I read 15 books and while I think over half of them were fantasy. There is also some sci-fi, some historical fiction, uh, some contemporary, some romance thrown in there. Um, so there is quite the wide range of genres today. Just like last time, we're going to start with the books I liked. They were good, they were fine, I enjoyed them for the most part. Then books that were eh, kind of meh, kind of lacking, a little disappointing. And then we'll finish with books that were absolutely fantastic, I super enjoyed, I wanted them on my shelf. I'll talk a little bit about March's uh, book club pick. I'm so excited. And then I'll also mention a couple of February releases that just came out this month that I'm really excited for. So without further ado, let's get started. First, we're going to start with The Girl Who Drank the Moon by Kelly Barnhill. This won the 2017 A Newbery Award. So this book is well beloved. It feels a lot like a nostalgic fairy tale. It's fantasy. It's also middle grade, so it's for younger readers. It reads very young, but I really enjoyed the storytelling aspect. I think Barnhill, it really felt like someone tucking you in at night or sharing a story around a campfire. It just felt so storytelling driven. I struggled with the pacing a little bit. It wasn't as quite go 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 as I wanted it to be. I, I will admit I fell asleep a couple times while trying to read this so I think I gave it a seven um, and the reason being mostly for pacing but it's super cozy. It's so incredibly sweet. Every year the people of the protectorate leave a baby as an offering to this witch in the woods who they believe if they don't give this offering of a baby to every year bad things will happen, uh, the witch will start coming into the protectorate and taking children anyway. So every year they do this sacrifice. Well, what they don't know is that the witch in the woods is actually good. <laughs> she takes the babies that are abandoned and gives them to loving families on the other side of this dense forest. Uh, make sure they get a good loving home, make sure they survive. Uh, but one baby, she accidentally gives a little bit too much of moonlight to. And so that baby ends up having powers. That baby is Luna and we follow her as her powers are tried to be suppressed, as her powers grow. She has a friend who is a very teeny tiny dragon. He's like pocket size. He's so stinking cute. There's a swamp monster who is a poet. He's like this ancient beast. He lives in the bog. Uh, it's kind of implied that he is one of the first creatures or even like the creator of the world. So that's super interesting. Then of course you have the witch. Um, there's a couple of other characters thrown in there too, but overall it's just really sweet, very reminiscent of fairy tales. Um, it was a really enjoyable read. I, I could see why it gets the Newbery Award. There's a lot about truths and lies in this book. I think it will really encourage children to ask questions. There's a great quote, knowledge is power but it is a terrible power when it is hoarded and hidden. Just so good, I, it has some great morals, um, and overall just super delightful, very fanciful classic fairy tale, and I think you'll enjoy it. Next we have The Adventure Zone graphic novel. This is book one of The Adventure Zone series. If you're not familiar with The Adventure Zone, it started out as a podcast with three brothers, Travis, Justin, and Griffin, and their father, Clint. They would get together, they would play D&D &D and other tabletop role-playing games. Um, and this is based on their very first weeks of this podcast. So this book definitely reads more as like a chapter one and prologue of a grander story, because it is. 
These books are so funny. They're so witty. The illustrations by Carrie Peach are absolutely stunning. The print quality is so beautiful. Just very vivid. You fall in love with these characters. Um, it's so sweet. I can't wait to get into the next books. I've had them on my TBR for quite some time. I already know the story, but it's been really fun to see the podcast transition into a more physical format. I think you'll really enjoy these. I had me laughing out loud. They're so great. The story follows Magnus, a human fighter, Taco, who is a wizard elf, and Merle, who is a dwarf cleric. Those are their D&D classes. And these three unlikely heroes become fast friends. Um, they're sent on a mission to find Merle's last cousin and things quickly get out of hand from there. It's so much fun. I, I can't say much without spoiling it, um, but highly recommend both the podcast, The Adventure Zone, and the graphic novels. The graphic novels are based on the very first campaign called the Balance Campaign. It's the first 69 episodes in that podcast. They have several other campaigns that are just as magical and amazing, but these graphic novels are just based on that first one, Balance. Next we have Nettle and Bone by TJ Kingfisher. This book actually reminded me a lot of The Girl Who Drank the Moon just because it has that classic storytelling nostalgia to it. This book is really short. You can read it in one sitting and it is just so wholesome and delightful. Delightful. When the story begins, we see Mara, our main character, who is a princess. She's the third born princess, so she has lived most of her life on a convent. She is on this mission doing these three tasks for a dust wife or a grave witch. It is a witch that communes with the dead. They kind of look over and reside on cemeteries, things like that. We're not quite sure why Mara is working on these tasks. It will be kind of revealed to us as time goes on. Um, but we quickly realize that her sister is married to a horrible, horrible man. So Mara is trying to get her out of that situation. She finds herself with a very unlikely group of uh, heroes of some found family. You've got Mara, you've got a dog made of bones, you've got kind of an excommunicated soldier, you've got a fairy godmother, and did I already say the dust wife? Mm. So these five people end up going on this mission together. When you think about the stakes, the stakes are very, very high. But the way it's written, it makes it feel very cozy and very low stakes. One of my dear friends, Ellie, you may know them as Little Ghost Ellie. <laughs> when they found out that my library wait for this book was so long, they gifted this book to me. Uh, they gifted this ebook to me and I was so, so happy and thankful. So thank you, Ellie, for allowing me to read this book. Um, and Ellie also made this beautiful, wholesome, so cute illustration of the dust wife and her demon chicken. And I just had to share it with you. So here it is. Ellie is so talented. Please go follow them. If this illustration doesn't make you want to read the book, I don't know what will. It's got a great found family trope. It's got a little bit of romance sprinkled in. It's funny. It's witty. There's actually a few little tidbits of horror thrown in there. You can definitely tell that TJ Kingfisher writes horror very well. For instance, there's a very creepy puppet that is on this one lady's shoulder kind of controlling her. Little creepy elements just sprinkled in that make you go, oh, okay but delightful nonetheless. I think you will really like this one. I enjoyed it so much. And like I said, really quick read, uh, very enjoyable. Next, we have Early Departures by Justin A. Reynolds. Prepare yourself. This book is very, very heavy. This book is all about death and grief and forgiveness and guilt but it is so beautiful. It's also a very quick read. I actually listened to this book and I really, really enjoyed the audiobook. I think the narrator did a great job. This book is contemporary realistic fiction with a big science fiction element. This book starts off with our main character, Jamal. Jamal's parents have recently passed away and he now lives with his sister who is pregnant. And 
We don't know what happened to his parents, but we do know that he blames his best friend, Quincy, for their death. A little bit of time passes in the story, not much. This isn't a spoiler because it's written on the back of the book, but Quincy actually ends up passing away pretty much in Jamal's arms. Very traumatizing. Uh, Jamal is having to go through three deaths that are were people very close to him in a very quick amount of time. The big science fiction component of this book is that doctors approach Jamal and Quincy's mother saying that they can bring Quincy back to life with a new program that was invented and give them about a month's worth time left with Quincy to say their goodbyes. It's a beautiful story. It's very psychological in the sense that it's really focused on the internal mind and monologue of Jamal as he's experiencing all of these things and thinking about life and death and uh, guilt and forgiveness. He's struggling with, you know, forgiving Quincy for the death of his parents, but then blaming himself for the death of Quincy. And even though this book touches on a lot of tough subjects, I found it actually strangely comforting. I think it approaches all of these topics with a great deal of thoughtfulness and love. And that is what the story focuses on. Even though it's a story about death, it focuses on family, friendship, and love. So I'd highly recommend it, but just make sure that you're in a space where you feel comfortable crying because you probably will. <laughs> Next, we have Kingdom of Ash by Sarah J Maas. This is the final book, the seventh book, or if you read the prequel, the eighth book of the Throne of Glass series. I read it. <laughs> I sure did. I read all these books. Um, I have lots of thoughts and feelings about this series. I know there are so many people who dearly love this series. I think if I had read it earlier in my life when I was younger, I would have liked it a lot more. But Ultimately, I don't think I can fully recommend this series to everyone. <laughs> I didn't really enjoy the series until we got to about book four. <laughs> so to recommend a series and say, oh, just get through the first four books before it gets good is a lot to ask of someone. You know, we have such limited time on this earth, <laughs> so... I don't think I can recommend this series in good faith. Did I enjoy the seventh book? Yeah, it was much too long. It's almost a thousand pages and it could have been much, much shorter, but I'm glad I'm in the know. Now I can understand all the TikToks and memes that are out there. Um, and I can also be in the know for any Sarah J Maas books in the future. If you know what I'm talking about, you know what I'm talking about. No spoilers. But yeah, if I wasn't reading this because of the Moss universe, I probably wouldn't have finished the series. I'll say that. <laughs> there were some great elements in Kingdom of Ash. I think the things I liked the best were some of the battle scenes were described really well. Manon and her, uh, her whole crew, her 13, were definitely the best part of the book. I still struggle to like Aelin, and that's really bad when that's the main character. So yeah, it was fine. I think I would also give it a seven. If I had to pick a favorite book out of the entire series, I think it would still be uh, Tower of Dawn. Like I said in January's video, Tower of Dawn still remains to be my favorite. I know that's a little controversial, but there we have it. <laughs> Moving on before people get angry at me. Next we have Felix Ever After, which Oh, I finished this just a couple of hours ago. We follow Felix, who is a black trans boy in New York. He wants to go to this big university, but his family doesn't have a whole lot of money. His mom left him when he was really, really young. So he's kind of contemplating her abandonment of him and wondering what's wrong with him, is it his fault? He feels like he can never be truly loved and enough for somebody. So he's struggling with all of those things. He's in a really cool summer art camp. So I really liked the setting of this book. I thought the way New York was described and the art camp was descri described uh, 
was very vivid and I could really imagine myself there. But essentially, Felix goes into the art program one morning and someone has put together a gallery of all his old photos before he transitioned along with his dead name as the name of every piece which means someone hacked into his Instagram account, stole all of his old photos, put them up on display for everyone to see, and it's just horrible. So part of this book is a mystery of him trying to figure out who did this. Uh, the perpetrator is also messaging him on Instagram every day saying very horrible transphobic things. So he's trying to figure out who that is. He's also trying to fall in love. He's never been in love before and that's one of the things he really wants to feel. He wants to know what it feels like to be in love. But this book is just really sweet. I think it has a lot of great discussions, brings up a lot of great points. I'm only, I put this in good, not great, just because I think it got a little long-winded a couple of times. I think some of the conversations and dialogue went on a little too long. Um, but it was really quick. I listened to this. I think it was about eight hours, so not a very long audiobook. But yeah, great story about acceptance, um, how to deal with bullying, transphobia, how to not deal with bullying. Yeah, just really delightful. I don't know if I was just in a really good mood this month or I was just really enjoying reading or what, but I only have three books in the meh section and they barely made the mess section. I enjoyed so many books. We have so many uh, books in the great category. Uh, so I guess it's a good sign, but I don't know. Maybe my emotions swayed my, my decisions and reviews this month, but I guess we'll see if I ever reread some of these later. Uh, the first meh little disappointing book we're gonna start with, but remember, I still enjoyed most of these for the most part, is The Other Black Girl by Zakia Delilah Harris. This book follows Nella, who is in the publication industry. So it's a very corporate setting, very race to the top, climb over your coworkers type thing. She's the only black employee at Wagner Books, but a little into the book, she gets another black co-worker and she's so excited for this, so excited to have someone she can more relate to in the office. But things start to go a little strange before the, between the two of them. Um, she starts getting some weird racist notes put on her desk. She can't figure out who's doing it. So in a way, it's a little bit of a mystery. My main gripe with this book is that there's, we follow Nella in third person point of view, but then there's random other chapters like dispersed throughout the book and first person point of view of f like four other women. And it was honestly just really confusing. <laughs> you don't really know what's going on and I get that's part of the point, but it was hard to remember who these women were. It not only switched point of views, but it switched time and years also. So it, it kind of spans over 40 years, but there these chapters are so few and far between that you wouldn't be able to remember what was happening in this person's chapter the last time you saw them. So because of that, I think this will actually translate better on TV. And it has been picked up by Hulu to be a series. So I'm actually really looking forward to this because while I was reading it, I even thought, oh, I think this would make much more sense visually <laughs> where I can see these people and identify them rather than trying to keep up with all these perspectives switching. Um, I think TV can sometimes be easier to have kind of those thrilling elements. There, there are some times I felt like a little spooked here and there, but not much. And I think the TV show could do a little bit better job of that. Also, there was kind of a science fiction Thing put in at the end to kind of explain everything and I, I don't think it was explained enough to be believable. I liked the idea. I just think it needed to be a little bit more explained. So 
not overall, is this a bad book? No, I was just confused for a lot of it and think there were some elements that could be better. And all that to be said, I'm really excited for the TV show. I think it's about 350 pages. It's on Kindle Unlimited. Uh, so if you have time and want a thriller that kind of talks about racism and white privilege, then go for it. If you want two recommendations of books that kind of tackled the same things, thrillers that also had elements of what it's like to be black in America and racism and white privilege, things like that, then I would recommend Jackal by Erin E. Adams and When No One Is Watching by Alyssa Cole. I read both of those last year and really, really enjoyed them. Okay, next we have Sorcery of Thorns by Margaret Rogerson and I'm honestly scared to put this in here because I know so many people love this book. It is so beloved on booktube, but it just fell flat for me. I don't know if I had too high expectations because I had seen so many people talk about it, but it was it was really hard for me to get into. And once I finished it, I, I haven't really thought about it once, like a single time. So in this world, sorcery and magic is considered evil. We follow Elizabeth who was left on the doorstep of this library when she was a baby and has grown up her whole life in this library. Now libraries are special in this world because the books are pretty much alive in a sense. They can kind of talk, they can whisper, they can try and self-destruct. So the thing I liked best about this book is the magic system, is the libraries. I thought that was really cool and interesting. And there's different levels of books like, oh, this is a level eight grimoire, which means it's really, really dangerous and they have to keep it up under lock and key and in a cellar and in a special place and they have to lock down the whole library if they ever want to move it, things like that, because the books contain so much magic and magic is evil. Something happens and a grimoire escapes and Elizabeth essentially gets blamed for it. The director of the library passes away, who was kind of Elizabeth's closest friend and confidant, kind of a motherly figure. And so Elizabeth is completely blamed for the situation and has to go on trial. Before she can go on trial, she's attacked again by some force and she meets Nathaniel, who is a sorcerer. Dark, handsome sorcerer with a demon friend named Silas, who's also beautiful, because of course he is beautiful. Together they all escape these bad guys, they live with each other for a time. Nathaniel kind of gave me Howl vibes from Howl's Moving Castle. He was kind of witty, kind of tried to use his charm to cover up how sad he was, that type of thing. Silas was probably my favorite character if I had to pick one, but I don't know, it just fell flat for me. I, I didn't love the romance aspects of it. I think some of the magic elements were confusing, although I do think it was the best part of the book. I don't know, ultimately, like I just, I found myself wanting the book to be over. I think it could be a lot shorter. I think it was about 450 pages. But yeah, I was just I was just disappointed. I, I've heard so many good things that I think maybe that kind of tainted my expectations. Just wasn't for me. It wasn't my favorite fantasy. Okay, our last little like meh disappointing book is The Davenports. I'm really I'm really sad about this one. This book just came out in January. It is historical fiction romance. Um, we follow four different black girls during the early 1900s, like 1910s. Um, two sisters, their best friend, and their servant. All four girls have their own romance story. And I think that was the issue because this book is only like 350 pages long. And to try and tackle one romance and make it believable, I think is hard enough. So to try to do four in one was just a lot. It ended up making me not believe in any of them because there just wasn't enough time spent with each individual person. It kept switching point of views. The historical part of this book definitely takes a backseat. Like that is not 
that's not the point. <laughs> it's like most of the plots aspects of this book could still take place today. Um, there were some interesting things about their dad has a carriage company and they're trying to convince him to switch to automobiles. So that was kind of an interesting plot that I liked. Um, there was also a lawyer. Um, they're living in Chicago, by the way. There's a lawyer from the South who comes up to tell everyone about the Jim Crow laws that are happening, um, how lots of their black friends and family and folk are in danger. And so he's trying to like raise funds and raise awareness. And uh, one of the sisters made a decision at the end of the book that I was so excited about. I was like, oh, this will make it so interesting. Like book two, cause I believe it's gonna be a series this will make me want to read book two. Like even though I wasn't enjoying most of the book, this one decision will make me want to read book two because I find it so interesting. And then right before it ended, she changed her mind. And so now I like don't want to read the next one because <laughs> I was so hoping she would make this decision and then she did and then she went back on it. So I was really sad. But yeah, ultimately, I don't know. It just, it tried to do too much, I think. And were there some great quotes thrown in? Yes, there were some fantastic quotes. Let me find one. Okay, this is one of my favorite quotes. Olivia remembered the moment she'd realized that every black person she knew was touched by the horror of slavery. Sometimes Olivia felt it like a wound hidden deep under smooth skin, one she didn't remember receiving, but that ached nonetheless. So it mentions generational trauma, it mentions racism, of course. If you if you just enjoy romance, I think you'll enjoy this. I was looking forward more to the historical fiction aspect of it, which just wasn't quite there for me. But like I said, none of these books in the meh section were bad. I just, th maybe they disappointed me a little bit. So if any of these sounded interesting to you, I would still say go ahead and read them um, because my reasons for not liking it might be your reasons for liking it, you know? So, all right, now starting off with our great books section. We're gonna start with The Book of Goose by Jian Li. This book takes place in post-World War II, poverty-stricken provincial France. It was so utterly fascinating to me. It was so intimate and psychological, not in the thrilling way, but in the way that you're just constantly evaluating what the characters are thinking and doing on a, an emotional and mental level. It really explores reality versus make-believe, obsession, especially with uh, obsessive friendships, also with a sprinkle of societal expectations of women. This book follows Agnès and Fabienne, and they are two best friends uh, in France during this time who love to make up stories for each other. They've witnessed a lot of rough things, lots of sickness, child death, women dying in labor, that sort of thing, and so they kind of write these stories as a way to cope with what they've seen. Well, they end up sharing these stories with this man who helps them get published. And it turns out that people absolutely love the book and Fabian convinces Agnès to say that it's just her book. So Agnès ends up getting all these crazy opportunities, even though Fabian is the one who really came up with the stories and Agnès really just kind of wrote them down. She gets all the awards. She gets to go to a really fancy boarding school in England. It's a very slow, intricate plot. Like nothing super exciting ever happens. So if you really want a plot that's very like exciting and go, 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 then this will definitely not be for you. It's very slow. I actually listened to the audiobook for it. Um, and found it fascinating and I got to hear all the correct French pronunciations because in my head I would not be able to do that. But yeah, I just, I could not put it down. I kept wanting to listen to figure out what happened to these two girls. It was just, it felt so unique. Now I really want to read more of Jian Li's books. So we'll see if I like her other stuff just as much. But yeah, just really, really interesting. That's all I can say about it. Like, is it exciting? Is it fun? 
No, I just couldn't put it down because I had to know what happened. Next, we have The Stars Beneath Our Feet by David Barclay Moore. This is another uh, middle grade, even more like fourth and fifth grade level read. It has won so many awards. I also kept seeing everywhere online that it's supposed to become a movie directed by Michael B. Jordan, but I couldn't find any more information on that. So if you know if that happened or is going to happen, please let me know because I would love to see that. But we follow Lolly, who is a kid going through a lot of big, scary adult things. His brother was recently shot and murdered in a what is to believe to be a gang related incident in New York. Lolly's mom and dad aren't together anymore, but Lolly's mom does have a new girlfriend who brings home huge bags of Legos. So Lolly uses these Legos to kind of escape from the world for a little bit to figure out his feelings. And at this after school program, he befriends a girl with autism. At first, he does not want anything to do with her. Lots of the people at the program make fun of her for her weight and her disabilities, but they quickly form a fast friendship. He stands up for her. It's really sweet. He also has a best friend that is considering becoming a part of a gang and is trying to convince him not to, but at the same time wondering if he should as well. I think it teaches kids about the impact of choices and how one choice can change your entire life. It's really quick. I listened to the audiobook for this one as well. I was on my way to Trader Joe's when I finished it and had to park and cry in the car for like mm, five minutes <laughs> before I could go inside. Um, it's really sweet. It has a happy ending. <laughs> Next we have Legend Born. This was our book club book for this month, for February in the Best Bestiary Book Club. This book was so good, y'all. Okay, all the hype is real. I was a little concerned with the first half because they're so much involved with the magic system. There's lots of names and vocabulary to kind of wrap your head around, so I think that limited a little bit of my enjoyment of the first half but once you like get used to it and get get it in your brain the second half flies by it's so crazy it's so good the last hundred pages were crazy i don't think we know how many books are going to be in the series total i'm kind of hoping it's going to be a trilogy because i just i love trilogies but it's called the legend born cycle so tracy dion could really do as many as she wants <laughs> So we'll see. Uh, like, I like I talked about in the last video, uh, this book takes place at the University of North Carolina present day, but it has magical elements. It gets into King Arthur's knights and the myths and legends surrounding that. It tackles white privilege and racism and how in the South there's all these spaces that black people do not feel like they belong because of the horrors of slavery colonialism, etc. Um, I think it is a beautiful job connecting uh, generations across her family background and showing how that generational trauma passes down. Ooh, I just cannot say enough good things about this book. I want to start the next one literally tomorrow. You can definitely expect Bloodmarked to be in my March wrap-up video. It also talks about death and grief a lot. Brie is dealing with the passing of her mother. There's a mystery element to it where she's trying to figure out if her mother's death was an accident or if it was on purpose and covered up. So the mystery aspect is actually really important to Brie's growth and her acceptance and, um, and path to healing. Uh, Brie goes to therapy. She meets a really interesting therapist who brings up a lot of good points. Her relationship with her dad is fantastic. Tell me in the comments if you're a Nick or Cell stan, because I'm very interested to hear your thoughts. I love them both. It's honestly hard to choose. It's hard to choose. Although I will say Cell is on the cover of Bloodmarked and not Nick. I don't know what that says, but it says something. Legendborn can't recommend enough. Read it, the hype is real. Then we have Ghost. Here is my third and final juvenile fiction contemporary book. Ghost is, oh, this book is so good. It gave me the same nostalgic feeling as I did um, as a kid when I was reading Jerry Spinelli books. 
So just super quick, super heartwarming. I loved this book so much. It follows Ghost who right off the bat lets us know that his father aimed a gun at him and his mother and they had to run and escape and he says he's been running ever since. He joins a track team, he befriends um, lots of different people on the track team. It's so diverse and lovely and diverse in really unique ways too. There's a person with albinism, there's a person with limb loss due to diabetes, there's an adoptive family. So just really great representation and I think we'll really encourage kids to not judge others just on the appearance because everyone has really deep things going on in their lives that you could never guess. <laughs> and so there's there's a great scene where they all go and get Chinese food and their coach asks them to share something uh, vulnerable and get deep. And every single thing they share, they realize how similar they are and how they're all really going through difficult things and how they all look to running and track to kind of, um, to both escape and confront those things. Um, it's just so wonderful. It made me cry. Super quick read. I think I read it in like two hours. Um, just so sweet. And it's a, it's actually a series too. There's a lot more books that focus on different people on the track team as well. I don't know if I'll read those, but I love this one so much that I might. And it was a National Book Award finalist. Next we have Fire and Blood by George R. R. Martin. If you know one thing about me, you should know that I'm a huge A Song of Ice and Fire nerd. It's a little embarrassing. If you don't know, Fire and Blood is what the new HBO Max series, House of the Dragon, is based on. It's based on about mm, this chunk of it. It's 700 pages. This book reads like a history book. It's not story driven or plot driven. It is in the point of view of different maesters, scholars, going through old texts and first and second hand accounts, trying to figure out the history of the Targaryen dynasty, the true history of this family. Um, so it's really interesting because it's so full of opinions from uh, different accounts saying, oh, this is what we think happened, but it could have been this or this. And that's why when you're watching the show and you've read this, it's so fascinating to see what direction they go with because there's, there's so many options. I love this book. I'm a nerd. The illustrations are absolutely amazing. There's Vagar and Arax, sweet babies. Queen Alysanne, my beloved. This is one of my favorite characters of the world of A Song of Ice and Fire. Um, it begins 300 years before the events of Game of Thrones. If you like Game of Thrones, it follows uh, Aegon's conquest all the way up to a little bit before Game of Thrones begins. I believe it stops at King Mad King Aerys' father. You know, there's family trees in the back to help you along, especially since there's like eight names that get reused constantly. Just a perfect example of high fantasy. Um, even though it's a history book, it still has dialogue sprinkled in that will make you gasp. It has moments where you feel so invested, you just have to know what happens next. So it's still exciting even though it reads more like a nonfiction book. At least it is for me. So if you like Game of Thrones, if you like House of the Dragon, then I recommend this to you if you like high fantasy. Um, if not, don't. <laughs> All right, next we have my one 10 out of 10 for the month, When Women Were Dragons, also by Kelly Barnhill, who did the first book we started with, The Girl Who Drank the Moon. This book is a, it kind of reminds me of Babel in the way that it's a historical fiction retelling with elements of fantasy thrown in. So essentially it goes back and forth. You have chapters that are transcripts, articles, scientific journal entries of um, a scientist trying to figure out what happened um, in the 1950s when there was a mass dragoning where women, some women, spontaneously turned into dragons. So it's him looking back on history, trying to figure out if this has happened before. It's him studying 
uh, different women's bodies and anatomy and trying to figure out how is this even possible, like what is happening here. And then it also goes back and forth in chapters of first person of Alex. And you spend a long time, you spend Alex's whole life with her. I believe it starts when she's like three-ish. It starts with her first memories and you go with her until she's like 80 something. So um, you get really connected to her. There's sapphic romance, great nods to historical things that happened. It even gets into like government cover-ups and how stories change depending on who's telling them. There's even a great, uh, <laughs> there's a great scene where a group of drag queens mid-performance turn into dragons, continue performing, and then vanish. It's so iconic. <laughs> it's so good. One of my favorite quotes, it's so small, but it's just, shame is the enemy of truth, because I think, uh, women and minorities have been told all our lives to feel shame about things so that we cannot pursue our true desires. It gets into divine feminine rage, righteous anger. I was pumping my fists and screaming throughout all of this book. I just felt so seen. Um, and I, I listened to the audiobook, so I can't wait to go back and read my new physical copy and highlight everything because there are so many good quotes from this book. <laughs> um, but yeah, I cannot recommend enough. There's messages that are very on the nose and then some that are kind of hidden and sprinkled throughout. You just have to find them. There's great metaphors for transformation and being who uh, your real true self is. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. Okay, now with all of those 15 books wrapped up for you, I hope you maybe got some good recommendations. We're going to talk about our March book club pick, which is Fable by Adrian Young. I'll read a quick little uh, sentence summary for you. Welcome to a world made dangerous by the sea and by those who wish to profit from it, where a young girl must find her place and her family while trying to survive in a world built for men. This is a duology. I believe there's also a prequel and a, another book within the same world coming out soon. Um, but for the most part, it's fable and namesake is the duology. Can't wait to dive into this with you all and hear all your favorite quotes and fangirl about things with you. So excited. I've heard so much about this book online. It's also on Kindle Unlimited. So if you've got that, you can follow along. We are on Fable and on Discord. And I will, of course, provide links to both in the comments below. We'd love to have you. Last but not least, I'd like to share three books that just came out in February that I am excited to get to. Starting with, of course, The Fifth Adventure zone. This one's a thick one. This one's uh, almost a hundred pages, I think, longer than um, some of the others. Um, but once again, Carrie Peach is just absolutely a genius. So beautiful. I know something that happens at the end of this book will change the series from here on out. It's a huge reveal. Uh, I'm not going to say anything, but this book it's going to be so good. I just know it. <laughs> I'm probably going to read two and three next month and try and hold off four and five for April, but we'll see if I can have uh, self-restraint. I might just have to read all four in March. We'll see. Then we have drum roll a day of fallen night this is the prequel to a priory of the orange tree i know so many of you are thrilled for this it actually came out uh today the last day of february can't believe it um i feel like i don't want to say much about this book besides it's very high fantasy uh dragons wonderful kingdoms magic system uh, Samantha Shannon's a genius. Um, that's all I'll say about it. <laughs> I'm so excited for it. I wanted the special edition uh, from Waterstones and Illumicrate so bad, but they sold out so fast. I'm very sad. Um, I mean, these covers are just absolutely stunning, so I'll be fine. But I wanted those stenciled edges. 
dang it, I wanted them. Last but not least, we have Revel by Lisa Mia Smith. This is YA, it says fantasy, mystery, some sci-fi elements, and the big thing that caught my eye was that it's inspired by Moulin Rouge, and it takes place in Prohibition, New York. Sounds interesting. That's all I know. That's all I know about it, and the cover is also beautiful. Um, so excited for that. Didn't see many February titles that caught my eye, so if you have some specifics that you're excited for, please drop them in the comments so I can add them to my TBR and check them out as well. But that's gonna do it for us today. I hope you enjoyed this video. Hope you got some interesting recs or learned about some you should stay away from. Thank you so much for watching this video. I'll have a paint with me video up next Tuesday that will be no mic, just music. So if you're tired of hearing me talk, there you go. It'll be behind the scenes of my most recent gouache painting. Um, but yeah, I can't wait to start Fable with you. It's gonna be so much fun. You can find me on Instagram at juliek.reads and juliek.art. Um, and I will see you next time. I hope you have a great day. Remember, you are loved and you are special. I'll see you soon. Bye.